Good evening and a warm welcome. My name is Anna Tutner and I'm a second year student um, of the Environmental Technologies and International Affairs program here at the Diplomatic Academy. And in addition to that, I'm the president of the SAGE Society, so one of the two societies um, organizing tonight's event. Um, SAGE meaning we are the students advocating for gender equality. And we aspire within our society to establish an equal environment for everyone by supporting gender equality through inclusive, active and intersectional approaches to open dialogue, policy change and advocacy. And together with my colleague Henri, we will be moderating tonight's panel session on Are We All Digital? Bridging the Gender Digital Gap. Uh, good night, everyone. I am um, Henry Gasquet, so I am a second year student uh, at the Diplomatic Academy in the Master of Advanced International Studies. And I'm also president of the Queer Society, which uh, strives to create an inclusive and discrimination-free environment, as well as is interested in queer culture and identity in international relations and at the DA so that everyone can feel confident in being themselves. Tonight's panel session is a contribution to last week's International Women's Day and a contribution to the com campaign Digit All Innovation and Technology for Gender Equality by UN Women. The campaign highlights the consequences of the growth of technology and innovation in our societies that became really evident during the COVID-19 pandemic. And those consequences are that technology and innovation are in general predominantly led by male engineers and that women and girls are less likely to access and benefit from digital technology, leading to lower engagement levels. And this increases the gender biases, not only in STEM overall, but specifically in artificial intelligence and machine learning systems. And in regard to shedding light on the role of all stakeholders in improving access to digital tools and to foster a more inclusive technology and to raise awareness of women and girls regarding their rights and civil engagement, we are very pleased to hold in tonight's event and Henri will shortly introduce you to our speakers and present tonight's agenda. During this uh, panel, we'll try to discuss the urgent need for an inclusive, for inclusive and trans transformative technologies and the importance of digital education for a sustainable future, as well as the relevance of digital education to achieve uh, the sustainable development goals of the 2030 agenda. So first, we'll start by a personal video statement from Ambassador Katja Perman, a UN woman senior advisor. Then we'll continue and resume with a, a UN perspective on the topic by Denise Iskandarova, a DA MAIS alumni and who's today an Associate Diversity Officer for the CT CTDTO, as well as a former coordinator of the International Gender Champions in Vienna. And we also both want to highlight the tremendous support, contribution, assistance that Denise has offered us to organize this event. Furthermore, we're delighted to have online uh, Fabian Krakmar as a speaker. He is a DA ETIA alumnus and is now a policy officer uh, for the EU coordination climate and environment at the Austrian Federal Ministry of Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology. And he's currently in Brussels, which is why he's online. And last but not least, as the Vienna School of International Studies uh, is offering next year a new program in digital international affairs, we're very happy to have Dr. Tatiana Kuto, a postdoctoral fellow at the, at the DA. Uh, her research is currently on analyzing European communication strategy, and she generally focuses on media content and framing, as well as attitude toward European integration. So as announced, we will now watch uh, the video statement by Ambassador Katja Perman. 
Excellencies, dear colleagues and students, it is my great pleasure to open today's panel discussion. And let me start by thanking the members of the students advocating for gender equality and the Queer Society of the Diplomatische Akademie in Vienna for bringing us together. Today's discussion is timely and fully aligned with this year's priority topic of the Commission on the Status of Women that brings together UN member states, civil society representatives, and other thought leaders here in New York. This year's focus will be on innovation and technological change and education in the digital age for achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. Digital technologies have brought unprecedented advances to improve social, economic and political outcomes for women and girls. However, they have also given rise to profound new challenges that may perpetuate and deepen existing patterns of gender inequalities. And in fact, the digital divide has become the new face of gender inequality. Only one in three positions in the technology sector are occupied by women. As we know, it is not only the technology sector in which women are underrepresented. Women's full and equal representation in decision-making and leadership positions is essential to ensure that our work is truly gender responsive and inclusive. Therefore, achieving gender parity at all levels throughout the United Nations is one of the Secretary General's priorities. And we know that gender parity is not just about numbers. It is also about creating enabling and inclusive workplaces where everyone has an equal opportunity to both serve and contribute to the UN mandate. We need to have more dialogues like this to integrate an intersectional gender analysis into our work, whether it is in the world of academia, private sector, or the United Nations. We must promote participatory approaches for technology design, um, design development and deployment, including community-based approaches involving women's rights organizations to create products and services based on the principles of accessibility, inclusivity, affordability and availability and cater to the needs of everyone. The digital age is transformational. It will require our collective efforts to ensure that the benefits of digitalization are equally distributed and that no one is left behind in the new digital economy and society. We here at UN Women look forward to an inspiring discussion that will enable us to move to a collaborative and concrete action. Thank you very much. Now I will um, open up a first round of questions that we have prepared for our um, keynote speech, uh, speakers. And um, the first question is um, directed to Denise Eskenderova. Um, and the question would be the following. How can campaigns such as UN Women's International Women's Day campaign of 2023 How can such campaigns um, help to raise awareness about the issue of gender bias in digital ecosystems and promote more inclusive and responsive digital tools? Well, thank you so much for having us here today. Uh, and that's quite an insightful question. Before I'm going to give you the answer, I would probably like us to take an opportunity and focus on three numbers, 22, 44 and 73. 22% is about women make up only 22% of artificial intelligence workers globally. A global analysis of 133 artificial intelligence systems across industries found that 44% demonstrate gender bias. And a survey of women journalists from 125 countries found that 73% had suffered online violence in the course of their work. That would be probably already enough when it comes to the question how we actually can, why we should raise awareness and how, how UN campaigns actually contribute, UN women's campaign contribute to the raising awareness. 
And now before like, you know, giving you more like in depth maybe answer, I would divide in this question because I had a feeling and look into the audience, physical audience in person, and I hope that the audience virtually can also give some, uh, some reaction. Probably not many of us understand uh, what is the um, link, what is the connection between UN Women's current campaign and um, the Commission of, on the Status of Women. Well, digital communication is a vital tool for diplomatic work, right? And currently 53.6% of the global population is online. But the share of that access is not equal. It's not even. And the benefits are not equal again. So again, when we talk about, when you were talking about digital ecosystems, and earlier we had like small chat outside there about artificial intelligence. When it comes to artificial intelligence, application of AI are still in the initial stages of research and development. And you all probably heard that in November 2022 that uh, OpenAI introduced ChatGPT, um, Chat Generative Pre-trained Transformer. This is both an opportunity and a challenge for policymakers. Now you're gonna ask me why? Because we have not enough knowledge about these um, tools and we have not uh, enough uh, knowledge how we can socially protect ourselves from possible damages, right? So this is another thing that we need to consider. And UN Women as a body, as a United Nations entity, they all bring together the researchers to find out, to identify these problems, to build this knowledge landscape and then once they have this gap analysis, they kind of can come up with some uh, resources and some possible solutions. I'll probably, I'm gonna stop here, and once we have like the round of other questions, uh, we can come back. Thank you so much, uh, Denise. And the next question is actually directed to our online member of the panel, so <laughs> Fabian. Um, so we had a question about how you see that digital, digital innovation and technology are important tools to advance uh, LGBTQI plus rights and how you envision uh, collaboration and partnerships with other government agencies but also civil society organizations and the private sector in advancing LGBTQI plus rights and the inclusion in the digital, digital age. Well, thank you. I hope you can hear me. And we switched the technical issues also from Brussels. And um, first of all, thank you for the invite. And I'm really happy and uh, glad that we at the A and Sage is still doing a great job also because the main reason I founded also Queer DA back in the days and I'm really happy that something is happening. And this also leads me to the to, to, to explain to the audience why I'm talking now about LGBTQI rights, although I work in the Ministry for Climate Action and many other things. Um, what I've been doing next to my full-time job, I try to promote diversity, especially in terms of LGBTQI rights. And when we look at digital innovation technology, there are essential, uh, these are essential tools in advancing and promoting LGBTQI rights. Um, those tools have um, allowed the community to connect, uh, to share experience, um, to mobilize, and also on social media platforms, apps and other digital tools, um, a community has been created uh, where people can find themselves, support each other and advocate for their rights. And this leads me to answering the question. So an important tool and how to do it is first of all, to find and create a community. So once we have a community, we can create safe spaces and people connect and people uh, can share their discrimination experience or they can uh, talk about the gender biases, sexual, uh, sexuality and in, uh, in, in traditional settings. Another point would be um, as a tool is social media campaigns. So social media campaigns have been very effective in raising awareness about LGBTQI people. For example, maybe same-sex marriage, discrimination, violence uh, about, uh, against trans people, what we experience or see currently now in the US and also recently in Austria as well. 
Um, another point, um, asking, uh, answering how the, the collaboration partnerships between these stakeholders can work is that uh, governments and civil societies can work together and summarize and find information and provide this online so people can access it. Uh, here, for example, I want to name the rainbow map of uh, the, the, Europe, the EU rainbow map which is provided by the International Lesbian and Gay Association. And they basically rank um, countries based on their diversity and discrimination-free um, aspects. I'm also especially talking about the private sector. Um, and the private sector is also something I am currently working on it because only recently in February 2023, I initiated the first LGBTIQ employee resource group, a network in the Ministry for Climate Action. And I'm currently working on it to, um, to expand it and to even to develop it even further. And we had a launch event, a kickoff event, uh, only three and a half weeks ago, which was really successful. And this is also what private sectors and companies can do, is providing uh, also um, an inclusive workplace. And start initiatives, which then goes interlinked again with my first point on communities. And last but not least, information is key and online resources um, are essential in, in sharing and expanding our knowledge about LGBTQI, LGBTQI rights, inclusion and diversity. Thank, Thank you so, so much for this detailed answer. answer. Absolutely uh, fascinating. And, and uh, to move on to our last speaker, uh, since you focus on political communica communication, we wanted to ask you how do you think political communication is gendered and present isn't framed in a way that addresses the different genders differently and what might be the consequences of this gender communication? Thank you. So um, it's just um, I was just thinking for the audience to come um, here, either physically to the DA or and also for the audience who is joining us uh, online. Well, if, um, you asked me whether communication is uh, is or tends to be gendered. Uh, the short, easy answer is yes. So in case we run out of time, this is it. Yes, it's gendered. Uh, but a more uh, another interesting question is um, why. And how do we see, how can we say, what allows us to say that, uh, that, uh, that, that the communication is gendered, right? We see that over time, journalist uh, schools form more and more women. They tend to be actually the majority of the gra graduates in, uh, in many different countries, right? Not only in Austria, but, it, but in journalism um, the schools in general. However, there are four other ways that, uh, or dimensions that... Um, shows us that this communication, uh, what we see in the media or the information we are exposed to on a daily basis, even if uh, what we call um, accidental information, right? Information or news that pop up on the mobile phone, or it used to be what they show on TV when you're not really paying attention, but these days it's more by mobile communications. There are four main ways uh, that shows us uh, and this is what I use in my analysis that uh, communicate that will lead to uh, bias in communication, in that case, to gender bias. The first um, aspect, the first feature is that even though we form, and this is not exclusive of journalists, we see this among lawyers, we see this in business administration, even though the majority of graduates, people who leave universities, um, maybe uh, in some schools in the case when we have a most part of the graduates are female for certain professions, we see that very few reach positions of importance. So this translates that we have a lot of female journalists, especially young female journalists. We don't have that many editor-in-chiefs, for example, right? And in the end, it's the editor who is going to decide. Uh, you may propose an article, especially, let's say, you're a freelance journalist. You propose an article. The editor say, that's great, but you 
please look at this situation, this uh, event from that perspective, right? So, uh, or he or she, usually it's the he, uh, will decide which um, articles will be published, right? And where in the newspaper they appear. Uh, I have in mind, uh, and this is valid for online information. So few women and, and minorities, right? I say this for a few women, but um, this is true for other minority groups as well in key decision-making positions. The second uh, element, which is perhaps the most important one, is the coverage itself. And we see that the coverage over time, we see some changes. This is what I do in my project. We uh, analyze and quantify and see this over time. So it's not just a guess, but we really measure. So we can compare it across different countries and over time. We see that media coverage of women, especially uh, politicians, for example, tends to uh, be way more critical of women when they are in decision-making positions. You see, I give you um, a recent example of the Finnish prime minister that she was, uh, there was a video that leaked that she was singing in her private uh, home. And she had to take like a drug test to show that she was not high, right? She was just celebrating her birthday or somebody, somebody's birthday or she was not possessed by a demon. Or, and actually, she really had to go out and explain the audience that this was not the case, right? And we see that in these situations, or you can look at the crisis under uh, Theresa May's government, for example, and or um, Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff, right? So when they went under uh, very critical situations, there they face harsher criticism, and obviously they tend to face criticism that has to do with their physical aspect, right? Way more than uh, than a man uh, than. Um, faces. And this, of course, reinforces the stereotypes in the coverage that uh, reinforce the image that female and other minority groups, especially LGBTI plus groups, are more unstable, are less capable of actually performing well in positions where you have to make decisions and positions where you are constantly under stress, so on and so forth. So they are in that sense less reliable, right? So um, yeah, again, this is a stereotype that uh, coverage reinforces, right? Many times in, uh, in ways that are much more subtle than what we think. And this is internalized as soon as the age of six, seven, right? Recent research shows that girls, this doesn't have to do with media, but about exposure in general, girls start to internalize that it is important to be thin as early as six years old, right? So these are stereotypes before we even realize, right? There is evidence of uh, stereotypes being reinforced at school, you cannot do this or you cannot climb there because you are a girl since the age of uh, elementary four, uh, three, four years old, right? So of course this sticks, right? These mental images are the ones that will probably carry along our lives. So few women in key positions, coverage. This also affects the publicity. That is also part, uh, it's not news, but it's also information that's being conveyed uh, through media channels that also tends to reinforce these stereotypes of uh, someone who is brave and trustworthy tends to be a male, right? Um, and, uh, and women are related, the qualities or aspects that are um, valued in women have much more to do with aesthetic attributions uh, and this type of thing. The last aspect has to do with access of information that has already been mentioned before in, um, in the video, in, uh, in the first intervention, that access to information and uh, communication technologies and mastering of information technologies, as you mentioned, uh, only 22% of the workforce in um, people who work in AI uh, on artificial intelligence industry are um, identify with female gender, right? So, and this, of course, reinforces. So it's, it's a cycle, right? And uh, all these aspects, they are interconnected. So in order to improve the situation, ideally we have to work on all these different aspects because we form more female journalists, but again, their information and their perspective uh, or more LG, openly um, LGBTQI plus people, their point of view is still seen as minoritarian, right? We see progress, of course, but this is very uneven across countries, even uh, within uh, the European Union. And, uh, and of course, this is uh, minoritarian, especially if we take it out of the Western context. But I reinforce that this is seen still uh, also in Western countries, right? This is not a privilege of developing, of developing countries. 
Um, yeah, this is what, um, so again, to go back to the very first question, yes, communication is strongly, there's a, is biased anyway, and will always be biased, but there's a strong gender bias that um, portrays, like I said, uh, women and other minority groups as, in a nutshell, less capable of uh, performing certain tasks and of um, exercising uh, positions of power. Right, and this is stronger than what we may think. Right, sometimes even ourselves we integrate some of these biases without even realizing. So it requires from all of us uh, also to pay attention and to try to be critical of ourselves. This is perhaps the hardest part. To and ask ourselves, am I being a bit biased here? Why do I uh, uh, and, and question ourselves? Right, and this is what we try to do in in academic uh, research and discussion, and also in outreach events, is to bring these discussions uh, beyond university, beyond academia, and beyond the jargon and 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 all that. And I talk a lot. I'm sorry. This is not an exclusively female attribute. This is uh, uh, my own <laughs> one. Of my own attribute shared with some people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this analysis of the portrayal of women and minorities in the media. Uh, we'd now like to open the floor to any questions from the audience. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, first disclaimer, it's like all of you wearing the same shades of brown or red. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite interesting. So my name is Zarina. My name is Zarina Dusian. I am originally from Kazakhstan, but uh, I'm an American. Uh, I've been living in the States for like past 12 years, and I'm actually a graduate from all women's college, the first women's college in, at the United States, Mount Holyoke College, which is part of Seven Sisters. So all this like gender equality and information about women empowerment has been engraved in me. And besides that, I had an opportunity to work with Global Fund for Women. And as of right now, I'm completing my internship with uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, the Department of Nuclear Safety and Security. So that's why I can speak from my perspective how technical my department is as of right now. Uh, we barely have any women and how often we speak about why all the technical officers are usually men and how little women have um, technical nuclear background in that perspective, right? So engineering is also another um, prospect that it's very hard and not so um, easy for women to follow into. And our director general, um, Mr. Grossi, he pushes for gender equality agendas as well, including the Marie Curie Fellowship, and they recently launched another one. And I was considering to applying itself myself, but I don't have any possession for a nuclear path as of right now. Uh, and I'm also a talker, sorry. <laughs> it's gonna be a little bit like before I start, yeah. So, and while I was doing a research, they were saying it's very hard for women to keep a truck while being enrolled and, and be successful in engineering truck because it's hard. Sometimes you have to deal with absolutely gender bias issues, right? Maybe you have a family to take care of. Maybe there are some other societal responsibilities that lay on you that's very hard to possess that successful engineering or hardcore technical truck. Um, and a lot of talking is being done around the issue, and I'm very passionate about artificial intelligence myself. Uh, and I'm just obsessed with ChatGPT and everything. Uh, and I do want to go that direction. And at the same time, hearing... You know, I can go any direction. That's what I learned from my background. I can be anything I want, but would I ever be on the top? Would I ever break the glass ceiling? Because the glass ceiling exists there. And it's so easy for men to click around and have that brotherhood of fraternity where they automatically support each other. And somehow women always left behind. So I'm trying to figure out here from the perspective it will be so beneficial for our economies to empower women and give us economic opportunities to contribute to national and international level. But at the same time, when I was reflecting on that information, I'm thinking, 
But man doesn't want to give us a power. If we're going to contribute $40 billion yearly to to U.S. economy, that means men going to have less power to control us. Is that specifically being controlled somewhere from the top? Or what kind of, like, because you, pro you probably, as an expert, you can give me a little bit insights how to direct my thought and, and clarify for myself how I'm supposed to structure my future and my future career. Should I go into technical field and always be as a supporter, assistant, or do I, do I have an opportunity? Thank you. Who's next? My name is Gertrude Ullmark. I have just a short question to you. You said 22% of the workers in IA are women. Are we talking about creators of IA or users of IA? Hello. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. My question uh, will be related to also to artificial intelligence because uh, it was told that uh, there is uh, w women abuse online that is happening, but we know that artificial intelligence uh, analyzes all the information that we have uh, in the internet, right? Uh, so my question will be, how do you see uh, this biasness towards the women uh, will be uh, managed uh, in the AI and how uh, this could be implemented so it's not discriminative? Thank you. And a small remark, it's nice to see uh, here neighbor, I'm from Kyrgyzstan. I would suggest um, to answer those three questions and then gather another round of questions. Um, so who would like to answer the first one? Well, I can start so okay. closer. Um, I'm going to reply quickly to the second question because the answer is very easy and short. Uh, when we were talking about 22% of women workers, actually they are uh, creators and users, so both of them together. Thank you for this question. It gives me an opportunity to uh, address that. When it comes to, um, first of all, congratulations with the internship at the IEA. That's actually really great. And in the Department of Safeguards and Security, that's something that, uh, you know, uh, it's a huge accomplishment. Um, when it comes to women in STEM, right, because we are talking about women in STEM, women in non-proliferation, women in nuclear science, specifically for IEA, of course the path is not that easy. And your question is like, it's a complex of many other issues we can indeed talk, even maybe after the conference you can uh, jump by. Um, join and we can discuss about that. But what I wanted to tell you regarding Lisa Meitner program or Marie Skodowska Curie Fellowship program that IEA created and launched, as long as you find this field attractive to, to yourself, why not, right? So basically what IEA did, they created the opportunities for you to basically empower yourself and join uh, the uh, the field, right? We were asking like how we can, how the economies can empower women. And um, another point was whether like you know like this conversation of dynamics of power, right? The control that you mentioned, uh, whether the men control or not. What I when I was also part of IEA back then and now CTBT, what I'm trying to do when I um, face any problems such as. I'm trying to detach myself from the problem emotionally, right? It's very important. And if you choose your counterpart as an ally and kind of try to sit down and find the solution, it's much easier. Otherwise, if you're going to uh, think that the other gender, the other uh, person in the room, probably some, someone who tries to control the narrative, it's not going to really help towards finding the solution, right? So that would be probably my tip from my personal experience and professional experience to you. And once again, like this is really huge what you're doing and I hope you are very proud of yourself. Um, i probably stop here if you wanna add to any other questions or Fabian. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for the very questions and for the for sharing your experiences uh, as well. From, well, an international relations perspective, when you talk about power, right? So usually states, which are, I mean, this 
earlier theories of it, I tried not to be too academic, they uh, compare a lot estates to, uh, to men, to people, but to, to men in that sense. And people usually don't want to let go of power because, I mean, they also struggle to be there. I mean, I'm not patronizing there. I'm just saying that once you get there, and this is where I think the gender component um, uh, kicks in because we have been raised to leave space, leave room, accommodate for the others, right? More, I don't know if I'm being clear, if I'm saying that usually girls are raised to be nice, right? And to behave, right? To, uh, uh, and that implies, uh, um, even it may not be very conscious from parents, that implies making room for somebody to reach to the top, right? Whereas the men, they have been raised to have this same strong sense of brotherhood, and of course they keep it stronger because they learn that, and we actually, we haven't learned that that strongly. And so letting go power is a hard thing. It doesn't happen naturally, normally. I mean, very few situations, but um, I think that at least now that has been some progress in offering some institutional ways that are officializing it. And even if it's kind of artificial and may look a bit awkward in the beginning, it's um, hopefully with time, this becomes a norm. Right, I don't know, uh, my area, I mean, doesn't have to do with uh, nuclear, uh, I worked on nuclear history <laughs> at a certain point in my life, and actually all people we interviewed were men. There was a history about Brazilian nuclear program, Brazil, Argentina, and we had one woman, actually, there was one woman, uh, but that's history from the 70s, and she was actually the only one, it's very interesting, I can send you the, the records, I think it should be available online. But it's in Portuguese, so sorry. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, uh, I can offer some insight on that. Um, but in terms, if you're looking, for example, at opportunities in data science career, not um, not only uh, artificial intelligence, but data science and data analysis. This is what I actually do for my research: quantitative data analysis at um, Texas Data. Um, there is a strong initiative called a very well organized called a Women in Data Science. You can just Google it. They are based. In Zurich, and they organize a series of events. Most of them are also live streamed, and um, to promote and they share initiatives to encourage women to uh, learn how to and girls and women to learn how to code and to and that, it's a group that are very supportive. They have actually branches. Uh, they were organized in Facebook groups. Probably this has evolved because we don't use Facebook anymore, but you can still find the people there. <laughs> Um, and they're very supportive. They're, this is something that if you are interested in that, uh, I don't know if it's the case, but if there is somebody interested in that or in the online audience, uh, there's a series of uh, online resources as well and other women who share their experience in coding and their experience in, in the industry. In, I mean, working as data scientists in academia or in marketing departments, uh, from Amazon to Airbnb or for international organizations uh, as well. I'm happy to address any other questions that we may, um, we may have left behind. I think there is one question that we have left behind, which is about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, how women were abused and the bi how can the bias can be managed and uh, allow a less discriminative, discriminative uh, artificial, artificial intelligence. intelligence. Is, is that, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for this question. So basically it's about gender-based violence and in, in AI. How to deal with that, right? So right now there is ongoing work uh, for like legal approach and uh, uh, some strategies to tackle that. I can also send you some articles on this. Uh, there is like, especially I know that in, in the States, last that I checked in the States, they actually had uh, hearings on um, on one of the uh, um, suggestions, right, for the for the law um, to be entered in the force, uh, into force regarding the AI and the uh, bi um, gender bias violence there. What I would also suggest when it comes, like somebody mentioned, either one of you mentioned ChatGPT today again, right? So I want to just. I, I understand the whole hype about that. This is really great. It's uh, quite funny sometimes. And I had uh, I have a friend who uh, came, also a student, he came recently saying, you know, my professor even allowed me to do the homework using ChatGPT, and I almost rolled my eyes because 
ChatGPT is really an interesting tool. However, we need to be careful in the sense that whether the data that, uh, what, what ChatGPT does, it basically collects all the data. But it doesn't really, you cannot say whether it's trustworthy, right? So you have to still be careful what you are using. Uh, and given that data, most of the data is very much not only gender bias, it's bias across all the intersectional areas. That's quite, um, that's quite scary. And it brings back to the last question from uh, our representative from Kyrgyzstan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, exactly, that's why we have this uh, violence in this digital ecosystem. So we need to, again, coming back to what Tatiana said, we need to be mindful of the data that we're using, right? So that would be probably my answer to... Uh, do you want to add? Yeah, just uh, very... Briefly, uh, because of the time, um, yeah. So it definitely just reproduces data that uh, stereotypes that, uh, that exist. And I think the lesson we get from that is a bit like the lesson we got in the early 2000s when we had this uh, free market illusion that, for example, market uh, you you didn't you don't need to regulate because it accommodates by itself. And actually, empirically, we know uh, every economist knows this as well because people usually think economists don't know this, but we all do. <laughs> um, um, if you leave market unregulated, you have a series of distortions, right? Monopolies, organizations that are formed that distort the market. Um, yeah. Yeah, and the same happens with information. We had this illusion as well that information, free information and internet would, be, would bring democracy worldwide. We, uh, I mean, and already as early as the Arab Spring, we, thought, we saw that actually, well, that didn't quite happen. It has to be somehow regulated in the same, to avoid failures in the same way we regulate uh, markets, right? Uh, concrete, so to say. Now there is less of a distinction between what is virtual and what is real, but, um, in the same way, this needs regulation and this needs professionals who are capable of operating in this digital environment and also and understanding uh, a bit of the technical part, but also the political dimension of that, right? This is something that, uh, that we are trying to do with the new, uh, there are other programs as well, but about something that we are trying to do with the um, uh, uh, Masters in um, Digital International Affairs is to form this type of professionals, right? Uh, that bring both technical, you're not a, an engineer uh, uh, in that sense, but you can understand the technical dimension. And if you do that, you are in a better position to provide, to suggest design uh, governance tools, for example, and how this can be regulated. It has to be regulated somehow because it's a situation where by itself, if market for information will not find an equilibrium, will find, it's very economic uh, language, but we'll see, um, we'll find instead a series of distortions and therefore we need external intervention from international regimes or states or organizations. Uh, and we need people capable of understanding these dimensions. So these institutions can be designed and it can operate in a, in a better way or in a way that maybe brings more inclusion or reduces gender bias and other types of bias as well. Thank you. My question is now directed um, to Fabian <laughs> online. Um, and the question would be the following. Um, how can policymakers foster accessibility to STEM for women and girls? In other words, how do you think the stereotype of men working in STEM can be dealt with by policymakers? No, to keep the answer short, I think the, the major barrier of accessibility into the STEM area for women and girls and also minorities is patriarchy. And when we look at patriarchy, what is patriarchy? Patriarchy is a social system where men hold the power and women are or were a long time excluded from the decision making and also um, how policies come into place. And also patriarchy, although we try to achieve gender equality, for example, and discrimination-free world, gender patriarchy can be reinforced again by social uh, societal norms and gender stereotypes. And those um, with uh, stereotypes with a view on STEM as a masculine field where which discourages women and girls from pursuing an education in the STEM, in the STEM fields. Um, also, it 
the, the system can also um, push more for um, or highlight. Well, I don't know. Highlight is the wrong word. Or like it, it, it also pushes. It, 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 it accelerates the discrimination, biases, and lack of opportunities. Also, which, uh, which goes in hand with the question one was just asked, and how to, how to, how can policymakers foster um, this? Um, is first addressing these stereotypes and addressing this unconscious biasness which we have. So policymakers need to work to address these gender types. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be um, neither of uh, those classical binary binary genders? Um, also, when we look at our biases, biases, they come, they're internalized. And we, this was already mentioned, they're internalized. And so they we grow up in a system where once we reach education by the age of six, they tell us what they we get told what is the normal area. So, and also when we say we don't want to we don't want to have this, we there are very uh, several studies which show that um, teachers in schools, although they don't want to, and although they are aware, they have this this unconscious biasness inside, and this needs to be addressed. And also um, how policymakers can further. Um, promote this is promoting diversity and inclusion um, by, for example, providing role models or um, from, uh, foster or enable more policies on recruitment and retention of women in STEM in careers, and which also leads industry to make it a more inclusive workplace and also a more attractive workplace. And also in a final, answer would also be just overall challenge part you're here and also never never assume and the 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 question from the audience should you go into a stem area although you see wrong careers you don't you still you see little career opportunities and i would say yes definitely go into it because through our entire life we need to adapt and we need to adapt to a system which tells us what is normal and what is not normal and so yes go in it and do it and we see that there is when we do this and when we promote diversity and when we promote inclusion in stem areas we can actually harness the full potential and of uh, of our collective talents which we all have on, on on the globe and maybe by this by by collecting all these talents and use the full potential of this of this human being we can create a better future probably and then we can also tackle the issues which we are facing now and even much further in the future. So overall, yes, <laughs> there can be something done. I will direct one more question um, to um, you, Denise. Um, so as we've heard before, um, we know that you led the um, International Gender Champions Network in Vienna. And could you please tell us a little a um, bit more about it and how do you see the role of um, networks such as the International Gender Champions in advancing gender equality in the digital age? Mm, thank you for your question. So for the audience, International Gender Champions Network is basically a network of heads of um, international organizations like DG Grossi of IEA or uh, heads of uh, diplomatic missions, uh, civil societies, uh, like the one I see, uh, one of the representative of civil societies sitting amongst us and other uh, kind of entities, right? So what they do throughout a year, they take two commitments and they're uh, they have specific rules, specific standards, and they need to make these commitments live, right? So when it comes to, and the commitments about fostering gender equality and women's empowerment, when it comes to specifically technology and innovation, the way how it is in Vienna, for example, you must see all these uh, social media campaigns or specific programs like uh, these fellowship programs or mentoring programs, anything that brings uh, youngsters or uh, mid-career participants, female uh, participants, this is something that 
uh, these high level people take as a commitment and they abide it basically and they have to um, achieve it by the end of the year. So that would be probably my uh, short answer to your question. Uh, now I think we have to wrap it up as Dr. Kuto has a plane to catch. <laughs> It has been a pleasure <laughs> um, uh, to uh, share this uh, discussion, share some thoughts, listen to your questions. And thank you once again, I said in the beginning of the event for, um, for organizing the event and for rescheduling it. Uh, I was not able to come last week. And uh, yeah, no, and I just highlight how events like this are, they are so important and especially student societies or and queer society and other societies that advocate for minorities, right? Um, it is important because it's not a taken for granted. We see a return of conservatism, uh, even in, in, especially in, in Western countries, so it's not, shouldn't be taken as a given, right? So it's something that we have to continuously fight for and be, and be vigilant. But I mean, now it's, it's not up to me to say this. Uh, I steal the center stage, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave this aside because otherwise I'll really keep talking. And I just wanted to um, thank everybody for organizing and showing up. Um, so yeah, as Dr. Kuta said, I think <laughs> we can, <laughs> we can uh, address a warm thank you to our three speakers and um, uh, please, uh, please join, join me in a uh, round of applause for them in their honor. honor. <laughs> and um, yeah, also Fabian, thank you for yes. <laughs> participating online. And um, I just want to um, say that I really like that you brought up um, the EU rainbow map. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm definitely going to have a look into this. And um, I would also like to thank once again um, Denise for motivating and more or less um, kickstarting this event for us. And I personally profited a lot from this event and I um, gained some very interesting insights, um, which I hope equip me um, for perhaps my future role as a digital policymaker. <laughs> And um, as well, thank you for your questions and your active participation. Um, and have a very nice evening. And let's bridge and close together the gender gap in technology with joint commitment and engagement. Thank you very much. <laughs>